Uh, so at ISO Group, for those of you who aren't familiar with the brand, we have several brands. The one that we really focus on is The Knot. The Knot helps couples plan weddings. You may have heard of it. Michael is going to talk a little bit more about it later. We also help connect couples to their wedding vendors and also more recently to their guests. Tonight we're going to talk to you about what we believe to be the product manager's superpower. It's user science. We'll get into the basics of what we mean by user science and we'll also talk about application because what's the point of talking about the basics if you don't know how to apply them. I'm the lead researcher at EXO Group, so when you think about how a lot of organizations are structured, there's typically these days when you're working in a lean product environment, smaller product teams that are made up of product engineering, design, sometimes product marketing, and there are many of those smaller teams. I, as the lead researcher, basically work as a service to all of those teams. So it's really up to me to make sure that someone like Michael here is doing the right research at the right time and learning really valuable insights that can make a high impact. Michael is a senior PM. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, uh, <laughs> we'll figure out how to do this. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I'm a senior product manager at the NOP where I focus on, on wedding guest lists for couples. So I think you guys are probably somewhat familiar with weddings, you have a guest list, you invite people. Um, and that's kind of what I focus on. And I'll talk a little bit more about it when we get into the, uh, the application base. Oh, we're super excited. We're super excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told you Krista tricked me into uh, spinning. It's so big on the screen. OK, so what is user science? A couple of years ago, we had a new head of product start, and I was the only researcher at the time. And before he even walked in the door, the product leads were saying like, oh, he really believes in user science. So kind of like, get your shit together, <laughs> And I was like, what is that? That sounds fancier than I am. It sounded like just a little bit more academic than the way we usually do things. But it turns out, it's really logical, easy to apply, and not that complicated. Some of you may already be practicing it. It's really, in a nutshell, the craft of understanding user needs and user behaviors. And it's important to understand that user needs and user behaviors are very different. What users say they will do or say they did is often very different than the actions that they take within your product. And Michael's going to get into some details about that in a little bit. Before we get into specifics, though, we're used to doing this at work, so we also just want to bring that here and make sure that everyone understands why it really matters. I'm not going to be pedantic and read through the bullet points. My biggest things that I want my audience to take away are that in order to build successful products, you have to understand why your audience is doing what they're doing. You can look at data and understand the what, but until you understand the why, you don't really have the full story. And then also, I am recently married and Michael's actually engaged and we serve engaged couples and we both acknowledge neither of us are the user. You have to like really put your ego aside and know that you don't represent everyone in every demographic that's going to use your product. And I think for me, from the product manager side, the reason that user science really is such a superpower is because a lot of our job as product managers is to get the most out of our resources, no matter how many we have, right? And user science really allows you to narrow in on the right problem to solve. There's a lot of problems that we could be solving, but user science allows you to narrow in on the right one to solve, and then test your riskiest assumptions first. So it kind of allows you to build confidence and de-risk the project as you, as you invest more and more into it. And by thinking about it that way, you can actually save literally months and months of time um, by incorporating user science correctly. I think that's really the biggest difference that I've seen 
between kind of like mediocre teams and mediocre PMs, and then really great teams and really great PMs, is the ability to apply user science uh, to really leverage the resources they have and deliver kind of outsized returns for, for their customers. So when that nerd boss started like two years ago <laughs> and came in with this term user science, he also started kind of shopping around this two by two, which made my life really easy because it essentially visualizes our philosophy when it comes to research at XO and what I really truly and strongly believe as the lead researcher there. Like I said earlier, it's super important that you break apart and understand that user intent is very different than user behavior. We have different methods to apply to get at what user intent and what user behavior are. Some of them are qualitative, which we have across the top. Some of them are quantitative. The ones that we apply frequently and we scale to all of the teams are really interviewing, surveying, and usability testing. And then uh, we're always looking at analytics and running A-B tests, and we'll talk more about that. The, the biggest story to tell from looking at this two by two is that you have to consider the signals that you're getting from each of these uh, feedback collection methods and tell the story of your users in that way. It tells the complete narrative. We would never run a survey or just look at data and say, oh, like, this is the thing. This is what 70% of users said this, let's go build it. Uh, so this really just tells a more holistic picture. Do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I mean, the only small thing that I might add is to think about why user behavior is different from user intent. And a really good example that, that we talk a lot about at the Knot is you can ask people, hey, would you download this app? People will say, yeah, sure, I'll download the app. And a lot of times they'll just say that because like, you're interviewing this and people want to be nice. And there's always, even if you're doing some kind of super intense like field study, there's always a little bit of a different context between your research and your observations and when people are doing something in your life. So you could be sitting at home on the couch and saying, oh man, I really need to like download an app to help me with my wedding planning. And so you start you search wedding planning in the app store, and you look through and you land on an app, and then you get a text. And then you look at the text and then you've lost your attention, and then you look at Instagram, and 30 minutes later you've totally forgot that you were about to download this app to help you with wedding planning. So that's why it's really important to separate those two things and really key in on uh, the right user need and user behavior. If it's not like really, really deep, then don't really have a chance of uh, solving that problem. So you have to be able to separate those two and figure out the right problems and then the right solutions to solve. Yeah. Part of that, oh, so, yeah, of course. Um, are you going to elaborate on why SEO is really interesting? I didn't plan to, but I can talk a little bit about it. Yeah. Uh, I did, I want to say one point uh, to what Michael had said. In getting at the intent and behavior, part of making sure that you do that is just upfront being able to articulate your objective. Often people like just want to do research because someone told them they should and they're trying to fill a gap, but they don't know how to define the gap. You really need to just be able to say, I want to learn X because I believe X. Okay, SEO is here because at XO, we really think about user science as user research, product analytics, and SEO. SEO allows us to understand where our users are coming in at the top of the funnel and what they're searching for, which we know that many of them are finding and discovering our product that way. So it impacts a lot of how we think about the rest of the journey. Does that answer your question? Is that some user behavior or is it because yeah, that's why it goes in the intent. It's because it really is an illustration of what their intention is in that moment. Like, I want to find a mobile wedding planner or whatever it is. Yeah. You're welcome. Actually, I would.
was gonna that was great timing because I was gonna open it up to any questions before we continue. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So for application, we got to the point at EXO where everyone was bought in to this two by two framework in user science and understood it, but then they were kind of like, ah. There's so many things we could do, and we're not sure when, and everyone had all these tools, but didn't really know how to apply them. And in practice, it's not as simple as three little circles that are connected. But if, when I'm forced to add some kind of framework to how research really powers the product development process, this is how I think about it. If you're gonna start at the top, and you're to think about, okay, we're building something completely new. It's really, you're, or we're doing some innovative iteration of something that currently exists. It's time to discover new things. And often the best way to do that is really just to talk to people. So have some type of interview session, but really the interview session, it's a conversation. It's talking to the people that you've identified as your target audience so you can really understand at a deep level what their problems are so that then you can make an informed decision about how to solve them. And Michael here may have done this once or twice. I have done it once or twice. And um, so, is somebody married here? Engaged? At least engaged. Uh, yes, yes, congratulations. You should talk to Chris and I later. We'd love to hear about your experience. Uh, has anybody ever been to a wedding as a guest? Yes. yes. Yeah, probably most people, right? And so, you probably have some sense that when there's a wedding, people make a list of people that they want to invite. They uh, invite those people, and then those people have to reply, right? Say yes, I'm coming, or no, I'm not. So, my job is to simplify that process as much as possible. And when I started on it, uh, I ended up didn't actually know anything about the process. Right? I didn't know, I just described it as like a very simple process, but it turns out to be actually very, very complicated. And we, we conducted, I don't know, a dozen interviews, and uh, two things kept popping up across every single person we talked to. One, which is that figuring out who to invite is really challenging. You're negotiating with your partner, how big of a wedding do we want, how much can we afford? You're negotiating with your parents, and your partner's parents. Do we really need this like random third cousin that I've never talked to to be there? Um, this like aunt who I don't really want to be there. And then it gets really tricky depending on who's paying for it. And then a lot of times people's parents uh, aren't like like a really good example is I'm not our users, but I'll illustrate this with, with uh, my story. My mom could not figure out how to use Google Sheets. Which to me seems like such a simple product, um, but bless her heart, she just couldn't. We just couldn't do it. <laughs> and I've heard that like many, many, many times over that it's very hard to get the list from your parents. So that's one thing: is that figuring out who to invite is really tough. The second thing is that once we invite people, collecting their RSVPs is really challenging. Usually, there's a date where you have to have all of your RSVPs in because the venue needs to know how many people are going to be there, your caterer needs to know how many fish and chicken, whatever. But your guests, think about it. They get the invite in the mail. Probably when they get home from work one day, it's been a long day, they open the invite, they're excited, they see, oh, okay, the wedding is in Miami in the fall, and they have to think, okay, we'll have to like figure out if I can afford it, if I'm free, I have to figure out who else is going, uh, I'm just going to put this inside right now and cook dinner and think about it later. And then you just forget about it, right? And so suddenly you have to text 100 people who are your friends and you kind of have to awkwardly prod them to, to send invites back or send their RSVP back. It's a huge thing. So these are the two really big problems that we identify. But just based on this and what I said, uh, we got, I don't want to spoil it. Just based on this and what I said, uh, does anybody have a sense of where you might start tackling which of these problems you might start with? Well, you have to invite people before you get past the feeds, right? Yeah. Is there any other information that you would want to know about uh, 
this product before you start got started. Yeah, you, you need to know all that to, to send the invites. So luckily at the NOC, we had a bunch of existing data uh, and kind of an existing funnel for the product that told us what was happening. So you can kind of see that uh, even if we, the collecting RSVPs happens so far down in the funnel, and there's a lot of drop off before you get there, that there's just not that much room for improvement. Even if we make a perfect RSVP collection tool, there's just not a lot of room to grow. But if we make even a marginal improvement to uh, the column where people are adding guests, then those improvements cascade down the rest of the funnel. And so we have a lot of room to make improvements and to leverage that step in the funnel to make the product better. So this is where we, we zoned in on, zeroed in on this problem. And then we move forward into the uh, execute phase, which Crystal will enjoy. And I just want to point out that, in, like I said earlier, in real life, none of this happens as cleanly as it looks on a slide. And Michael's example is a good one. He got a lot of qualitative data that allows him to understand how hard this actually is for the couple. And then he went back and he looked at our analytics to understand what would be the best step forward. So he's kind of, if you picture the two by two we looked at earlier, he's kind of like moving around that and using it to make the right, most high impact decisions. So let's say you do talk to a lot of your users, you have a better understanding of the problem, then you start getting ideas about how to solve it. You come up with different concepts. It's time to talk to people again. You could do that in person, you can do that remotely, but you want to start getting a signal. Are we moving in the right direction? Based on what we learned in the strategy phase, are the solutions that we're coming up with resonating with people? So, at, so we do a lot of concept and usability testing in this stage. And I told you about that. Yeah. So once we had zeroed in on the right problem to solve, then we needed to figure out what's the right solution to solve that problem, right? So, uh, so we, uh, we brainstormed, we brainstormed with the whole group, we narrowed all of those ideas down into a few different concepts that we really liked, and then we started to test those with users. I think the really important thing to stress here is that no matter what ideas we came up with or what concepts we had, at this stage they're not going to be right? they're not going to be like one hundred percent right. And so the really important thing is to test opposite ends of the spectrum and then get signals as to which way you might go. And then over time you refine your concepts through A/B testing. So we have a couple of these different concepts. One where you help people fill out their list by kind of relation of the guests to you. So I'm going to start with my family, um, and then my partner's family, and then we'll go to our parents and see who they want to invite, and like has to be there. And then we'll go to our friends and kind of so on and so forth. Uh, and then we have this other idea that, well, what if we just started right away with like sending a link to your mom and having your mom fill out the list and, and send it back. And so people didn't like that idea as much. We got like, a lot of like, um, strong feedback that that was not a good direction, which is super useful, right? It's really good to know that we were wrong before we started building anything. And so we said, okay, the, the kind of like groups idea seems like that's a stronger concept. Um, and so then we started working off that, going into the assessment phase, doing A-B test, and Crystal will intro that. We wouldn't be like, Passing it back and forth like that, we didn't literally have to do it. But <laughs> I think it's made, making us like reintroduce each other. So, yeah. In, so now you're at the point where you have your concepts, you feel strongly about one, and you want to release it to a portion of your audience. You can get feedback at scale at this point. How freaking cool is that? So you've learned a lot, you've gotten a lot of qualitative feedback up front. Now you're really moving into the behavior quantitative piece of things where you're going to be able to understand what users are doing at scale. And 
you can A-B test, and Michael will talk about the details of that. I also, as a researcher, just have to say, there's no excuse at this phase to not also continue collecting qualitative feedback. It's super easy to throw up, even if it's a one or two question survey, because then it gets you that really rich information. You know the what from the data, but then you understand the why also if you get that qualitative signal as well. Cool. And so, um, like Krista said, we need to start entering, like kind of leaving the realm of user intent and then putting this in front of real, actual people who are in the product and see how they really behave. So usually when you run an A-B test, which we did, and uh, I'll show you here. So usually when you run an A-B test, it doesn't work, and then you run another one, right? <laughs> it, it almost never happens that it like hits right away, and then you release the test to your whole audience. Usually you run it, it doesn't work, but you learn something, you always learn something when you run an A-B test, and then you make changes, and you do it again. So that's exactly what happened for us where uh, usually in any good A-B test, you have one metric that you're focused on changing. And we actually saw really positive results with that with uh, our, our experiment where people were adding a lot more guests. But then when we started to look at the proxy metrics in other parts of the product that we didn't necessarily want to move, but we didn't want to hurt, we noticed that we were making the worse, right? So we were making the product better in some areas, but then worse in other areas, and in such a way that the trade-off wasn't worth it. And so this is another really good example of the point where those three circles that, that we've been showing are kind of all happening all the time. So we ran into this problem, we said, what, what's going on? We dug more into the data to figure out exactly where it might be happening. We ran usability tests uh, with real users trying to use the product. And we identified a few different areas where people were getting stuck or where it wasn't making total sense. And then we, uh, again, came up with some design ideas to fix that. And then literally, as we're speaking right now, we're running our second version of the test. And so hopefully, if Kristen and I are fortunate enough to get invited back, we uh, will have the results from that version of the test next time. Just, just our example to try again. Uh, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> you may talk now. Thank you. Is this thing on? <laughs> so we really wanted to explain to you guys what user science means to us and how we really believe as PMs you can use it as your superpower. Whether you have a researcher on staff or not, like just to be completely transparent, I don't even help him anymore. He's right. just really freaking good at it. That's not true. Chris helps me all the time. Which is amazing. Uh, and then we kept talking about user intent versus behavior. Just always keeping in mind what the differences are between those and making sure you're aware so that you can make high impact decisions. And you're not surprised when you launch an app and nobody uses it. And just you're always going to apply what you're learning. And you should always be testing and always be iterating and always be getting a signal from the people who are really using your product. Because if you're not, I'm not sure what the heck you're doing. <laughs> Any questions other than where did I get my dance moves? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, that's pretty great. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. How do you decide uh, what would the control and focus group would be? What would that number be? Um, you, can't, you can give me a range. And how long would it continue? Cool. So um, the I guess to repeat for the video, the question was how do we decide on and make sure I understand. The question was how do we decide the right size for the experiment groups, yeah. and then how do we decide how long to run it for? So the size is basically just a math question. Um, there's some existing conversion rate that that we know since we're testing. Uh, in this case, we're testing per proportion, right, so the percent of people who are doing something. So there's just some existing conversion rate with the control product. Um, and then depending on if we're looking for like really big moves or really small moves, um, like we want to see a 20% difference or we want to see a 2% difference, 
there's all, there's like a formula that um, you can apply and, and just plug in the numbers of like this is how many the existing conversion rate this is the uh, like minimum detectable effect that we want to see and this is how confident I want to be that the number like that it's a true result and you just plug those in so long story short it's a it's a math question and there's a whole bunch of resources that you can find online to just do it. Like I used to know the formula, but now I just plug it in online. Um, there's one called evanmiller.org. Uh, that's the best one that I've seen. It, it helps you figure out uh, how many people you need, did the results that I find, are they significant, and it has different for if you're doing like a portion or looking for the average value of something. Um, so that's kind of how we do it. It's just a, it's a and as far as the timing goes, I think that often depends on the product that you're using. Um, so for us, like we have a pretty cyclical nature of things where people tend to like get engaged on the weekends and then they don't start planning until uh, Monday or Tuesday when they're at work. So it makes sense for us to run it for at least a week or two um, so that we can kind of like flatten out any effects that you might have from, from that timing. So I think the answer is that it, it kind of depends on the product you have and if there's any kind of cyclical nature to it. Does that help? Yeah, that, that uh, puts the things into perspective. Is there something to add? How do you decide that in terms of who would your first test would be? Would it be internal stakeholders? Would it be customers? Would it be a mixture of both? Um, that's a good question. And so for if we were going to test with like internal stakeholders, um, I think you would probably want to do that earlier in the process, like closer to uh, when you're strategizing or testing con, uh, I always say strategy. Um, if you're strategizing or testing concepts, that's where, at least at XO, we would bring in internal stakeholders and make sure that everybody is on the same page. And then once we start an actual A-B test, then we would run it in the real product with real customers. And at that point, you can decide, like, well, what's the best audience for this? Is it existing users? Is it new users? Is it people who have been an app user but don't have a guest list? And you can kind of figure out what problem am I really trying to solve with this and then target the audience that way. Yeah, I just want to add something to that. I make all of this sound like it's really easy because I want everyone to apply it. But there are scenarios, that was a really good question about testing with internal stakeholders. There are scenarios, even at XO, where it's hard for us to talk to people. Engage people want to talk to us. Uh, so that's not hard to run. The other side of our marketplace, we have wedding pros who are super busy planning weddings. And it's not always easy to get them on the phone or to get them to hop on a video chat. So then in that case, we may test with our customer service team who's in very close touch with those people all the time. So if you can come up with a proxy that's close to your actual user, that's better than not testing at all. Looking back at your two I two with SEO, I was wondering if you ever had a strong inbound that is event to your customer journey. We're getting a certain cohort with demographic where it changes the way you approach design products. The the one recent thing I could think of, and maybe you have something to add. We, we launched a new product recently that most people were actually using Pinterest to solve the problem. And now we've seen this major uptick in the search term that is our product. So it's an indication to us that we've reached our audience in a meaningful way and we're changing behavior. Other than that though, I would consult with our SEO expert to answer that question. Is there ever a tension between the product manager and the user researcher where you're like, let's test some more, and he's like, no, I just have to build this now. So, you know, let's just go ahead and start building. You can both answer this, yeah. but it, for me, because I'm one to many basically, depends very much on the PM that I'm working with. And Michael is one that I don't ever actually think we haven't seen eye to eye. Usually sometimes I'll have questions about, like, our inter do you really need to do more interviews? Can maybe you just move forward? Uh, 
And there, there was a time when before everyone was bought into this user science thing, it was harder. Like we were butting heads more often because someone would launch something before doing all of that upfront learning and we kind of be like, why, why would you do that? Like, we have all of these practices in place. But for the most part, we're having healthy debates like, is this the right research to do now? And as an organization, we're actually at the point where it's okay to say, like, F it, ship it, because we know so much, it's time to just move faster in certain cases. Yeah. Yeah, the not we are really, really fortunate to have a user researcher like Krista because we have a lot of knowledge. Um, but then there are just some things that you just don't know. And one of our company values is to kind of make fast decisions. And it's based on this principle that no idea is worthwhile on a whiteboard. And so you have the best idea ever, but if you don't actually put it into implementation, then you haven't changed anything or you haven't done anything for your users or for your business. So we try to use the threshold of, do I have 70% of the information that I need uh, to make this decision? And as soon as you get to 70% of the information you need, uh, you make the decision and you fail. And so I think that's one way that uh, we kind of like try to design, and of course it doesn't always work that well in practice, but it's one of the ways that we try to design the organization and the culture to kind of all align towards um, solving those problems before they happen. So I think that's kind of our way around it, is to um, have a bias towards action and then just try and get 70% of the information you need and make the decision for them. Right behind you. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, so I'm in the enterprise software space and one of the reasons that I'm looking for a new opportunity is because my boss doesn't really believe in data science. He just mm -hmm. believes in what one user code it says it's him. So, I'm trying to pivot and all the companies, like I'm in mean, insurance technology and all the companies I'm talking to are insurance space or fintech space and they're very focused on this. So I truck I have used some qualitative analysis throughout everything I've done and like I've kind of had to use my gut and it's been successful, but I'm trying to see if there's anything I can do independently to kind of run my own experiments and try to just test out some things so I can be educated talking about it. Um, I'll choose questions. Oh, I thought first you were going to ask about like how to change. <laughs> no, I don't. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. There is a good book. Uh, it's called Sense and Respond. That's written for the purpose of educating people at lower levels to then like manage up about this stuff and make bigger, broader changes. But uh, on the qualitative side. I would say to read some books like Erica Hall's Just Enough Research, it really breaks down different methods and when to use them and why. And then Steve Cortical's Interviewing Users is just really about how to talk to people and do field research that will get you really valuable insights. So if you're able to talk about like how getting signals from different methods is a way that you inform your product direction. I think most people who are following a lean method and believe in research, that's going to yep. resonate with them. Um, and really just knowing how to talk a little bit about when and how to pull each of the levers that we've been talking about, like when to look at the data versus when to get qualitative feedback. Um, yeah, I thought you were going to ask the same question that she thought you were going to ask. So Some people just aren't going to change this. Okay, so I think, one, you've probably already done a lot because you're coming to meetups and things like this, and so you're, you're learning um, a lot, and you can bring that knowledge back into the building. Some other stuff that, like, very concrete things that I might recommend are you can read the book Statistics for Dummies. Um, that's super helpful. I read that. Yes, you can also read Naked Statistics. Uh, that was by Charles Whelan. The statistics for dummies one. But those are two really good kind of like intro primers to help you just kind of um, understand like why um, the formula for picking the right number of people for a AP test is the formula, like why it gets you there. Right. Um, so it'll help you understand some of those basic concepts. And then 
I think um, a really good book to to read to understand like the product development cycle is uh, it's by Marty Kagan, who also runs Silicon Valley Product Group. Oh, how to make inspired. Uh, inspired. Yeah, I think inspired. it's called Inspired. That's a really good book where he talks about like here are the ten mistakes that people make. I think Marty and that group are uh, a very like high profile like went back when that was, yeah, it was cool. Um, <laughs> and so I think he's got like a demonstrated track record of success. So that actually might be another thing that I would do is try to like, with the internet now, anybody can write anything and just write, can just be garbage. So if you look for people who have a demonstrated track record of success, um, that's also super valuable. There's another guy who's my former boss named Gibson Bill. Um, and he was the VP of product at Netflix and helped transition them into streaming. And he has a website and has all these talks and articles um, that are super helpful. And he's actually who taught me user science um, and he taught Netflix user science. So there's a lot of good synergy there that I would, I would definitely take advantage of that. Then one quick follow-up question. Any like, tools um, that you guys use specifically use Python or R or is it just things that you can sell We at XO, we, um, product managers don't. We just use a mix panel, um, which is like just you know, it's like Google Analytics where you can go in um, look at stuff. One tool that I was going to suggest is usertesting.com. Yeah. Um, I think it's free, right, to, to up to an extent. Is that correct? I don't think that's true. I have no idea. It's like $40 user and then or something. Okay. I thought it was free for uh, up to a point, but it's not, it's like 50 bucks, yeah. and it can help you go in like practice doing tests. And they have a bunch of really good templates um, depending on what you want to learn, then you can take advantage of. Um, and I find those actually be pretty helpful to like, see, like, this is the right way to do this one. Yeah. And usertesting.com, if you are in a situation where you need to convince your leadership that people may not feel the same as they do, it's super easy to get valuable feedback and then make clips out of that. Yeah. Cool. You have a question, right? Yeah. Um, you guys, or do you guys have an example where you got either qualitative or quantitative data that like, clearly pointed in a certain direction, um, and then it turned out that was not the right direction? I can think we once built an app that you recently sunset. And I can't think of an example where we got the signal, we ran with it, and then we failed. I can think of a situation where we didn't listen to the signal, we ran with it, and then he had to sunset the product a couple of years later. So that signal, yes, we have to look back and look at the data and saw the signal. So what happened was basically, Leadership wanted to build another app for wedding guests. And a PM at the time did market research and other people had apps like that and a lot of downloads. So that was her signal that, well, if we do it as a strong brand, it's going to be successful. I didn't agree with that, knowing what I know about weddings and people. But at that point, my, my numbers are small. I do qualitative research. But I'm pretty loud. Uh, yeah. But they still didn't listen to me. So they built it. And you probably know the specifics of why it failed, but it essentially did it itself right the right problems. Right? Yeah. yeah, I think the, in, in this particular situation, I was trying to think, I don't know, I don't know an example where um, we heard data going in one direction and then that was the wrong, like, it was wrong or whatever. I think usually, when you fall into that situation, it's because you either have the wrong solution or uh, the wrong strategy. So, and you, or you just looked at one data point and not the full picture. Yeah, um, definitely that. And so I think in this particular instance, the fact that there was a demand for uh, some app that could like, help you manage your guests, that was true, that was right. Um, the solution of building an app that was separate from the rest of your wedding planning where like, your checklist is, and you're searching for vendors, and you're doing the budgeter. Separating those two was 
probably not the right solution. And so I think that's actually where it came into play. Because if we had the right data, uh, we just didn't necessarily apply the right strategy and the right solution. I'm so interested in this now. I have no idea. That's a really good goal. I'm glad that you said that we can't do this and like, like change people's reading scores and stuff. Because Facebook would just be like, yeah, we can totally manipulate the way they work. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Because you get to the point where you learn enough qualitatively, but you want to, it would be ideal to reduce it to a small percentage, but you can't do that. And you can't prove it at scale with everyone. So we have a user base of our families on that day, but you know, we can only do it you know, a dozen in person to test it. Yeah. Whatever schools will let us take our time for new kids to ask. Those tend to be schools who are already more interested in using data, which is not necessarily representative of the user base. Is there any way that you can? Like always have the original version and allow a portion of the kids to like opt into trying another one, so so that it's not like necessarily the real data. It's just like a test environment, and then they go back to I don't know maybe I don't know if you can incentivize kids. something that you want to learn. Um, and so what we do a lot is we try to um, make a list of like, the things that we want to learn, and that's what you start with. And then you can break that down into, okay, well, what's the best way to learn these things? Sometimes it's interview, and sometimes it's, it's some other method that was in the two by two there. And so you can, uh, whatever the, the two by two one. And so you can break down the things that you want to know, and then what we'll often do is kind of order them in what we think is the riskiest um, up front, and then try to learn that immediately. And so you might, if you do an interview and you only have five minutes, you would start with only the one riskiest question that you would have. Um, but if you have longer, then you could actually spend more time going through the other things that are uh, less risky. I think that's really the important takeaway. And you need to start with what you want to learn. Uh, and then you can kind of break down 
how risky it is, and uh, maybe we develop the questions to ask and the method to do it from. from Does that help answer your question? Yeah, I think a lot of times it's just your idea of just kind of zoning into what you're supposed to actually. Like, you know, you're trying to solve the problem, and then you're like, I'm also trying to find some information and make, like, connecting to make sure that they're the same thing. Yeah, it, it helps to just like always be. I'm kind of a stickler about stating your hypotheses up front, or else you could you don't focus in and you you're going to get a bunch of sloppy data when you do qualitative research. That's what's awesome about it, but you can't forget what the main points were that you set out to learn, and stating your hypotheses up front sort of force you to do that. So you could go into it knowing, okay, we're being really focused, but we're going to talk to a human in the case that you're doing an interview, and like the human is going to tell you things that you didn't anticipate because we're all so different and awesome. Can you do some kind of test like over the summer when kids are in school? <laughs> <laughs> I really want to solve this problem. Possibly. We have a, a school where they would be willing to play you know, outside of that. Part of it is they all start at different times, and they have kind of a lot of people working off of, but that didn't work. Do you need that? Hey, you're going to go up here. Her question is uh, how do you keep things anchored in problem space when you're having these conversations and not in the solution space, but then also in the solution? Yeah. Okay. So, like, you know, that's something that I kind of learned how to work through, but I'm trying to see it. Yeah, I, I know what mine is, is to be loud and to repeat myself. Like, whenever we're having conversations that don't tie back to the original problem, then I will just say, hey, can we all take a minute to restate what the problem is here? Because it seems as though everyone forgot it. And then also just, we're at the point where we could call people out, or like we, I do this, I'm like, I know I'm throwing a solution out there, but it'd be cool if, and, and then like just kind of pull back from it. Because sometimes it's hard not to do that because we know so much, but I really just think calling out, remember, here's the problem, or like writing it on the whiteboard and saying like, this is where my hair is. I don't know if you have anything. No, I mean, I think that's exactly right, is continuing to repeat yourself, uh, and ground yourself in the problem. And I think what I found successful working with different groups of stakeholders is to explicitly state your kind of like first beliefs and kind of like first principles that you're working off of. So I think in, in our space, uh, technology solutions change rapidly. And so, uh, but problems, right? And so the really important thing is to ground yourself in things that don't to change. So like for many guest lists, people are always going to want things to be cheaper, faster, simple. And that's not going to change, whether it's today or 100 years from now, but the solutions are going to rapidly change. Right? Um, and so beyond that, the other thing is that most ideas don't work, right? Um, I think that's like a fundamental, like foundational element of product development, is that most ideas don't work, and the ones that do work take many iterations to get right. And so I think you have to repeat yourself a lot to get everybody on the same page. That's, that's just the way the world works. And instead of fighting against that, we should actually embrace it and then um, kind of design our product development processes to test a lot of ideas really quickly and cheaply until so we get a signal that something's going in the right direction. You know, um, and like, it's not linear like that. You have to repeat yourself a bunch, you make mistakes, Sometimes get outvoted. Uh, I think over time, if you keep repeating that and keep being loud, then you can get that. Uh, uh, how many user cases do you guys use? How many of you like product? Really? I'll say. I said none. Oh. oh man, personas for us have kind of. Shitty history, really. We've done them poorly. We, we've, in the past, we've gotten very too focused on like different demographic groups, and then we realized this isn't. It's not that different. Planning a wedding isn't actually 
that different. So now we're doing segmentation so we could understand at scale, like what are really the levers? Is it budget and style? Or should we be looking at something different? But it's for wedding planning, it's really about like what level of personalization you want and how much money and time you have to put into it. On the wedding pro side of the spectrum, we actually have four really well-defined personas that have allowed the team to better understand what they're designing for. And that's the follow-up is, how frequently do you guys review those four pro personas they're relatively new in the past like year or so, and we've probably updated them at least two times, but more to more to iterate on the original versions that we came to than, than that we learned anything new. We just realized, oh, it would be helpful for product managers to have this data point. Let's add this. And we're and based on the feedback we're getting from PMs and from marketing, we're actually collecting data points in a more standardized way so that we have a better idea of who these four buckets of wedding pros are. Um, on the flip side of that, I, I've actually never really used personas successfully just for whatever reason. But one thing that um, historically getting better at is segmenting our actual users. So not by necessarily persona type, but by behavior. So for instance, if you looked at the average number of guests that are added to a guest list, you'd see some number. But if you looked at the raw data, you'd see there's uh, some percentage of people who are adding like hundreds of guests, and then some people are, are going to their guest list but not adding anybody, and then some who are adding just a few people. And so then you can break it down by like those user types and figure out, well, where are we going to have the biggest impact and like what has the easiest solve. Um, and so I found that it's not really a persona, but breaking them down into segments to actually work uh, really well for us. Yeah, and I just want to add one thing to that. We have found, has anyone heard of the jobs to be done framework? That has been more actionable for us than thinking about personas. So just thinking about what a user wants to hire than not to accomplish and coming at things through that lens has been actionable. That's uh, uh, Clayton Christensen, who's like a professor at Harvard Business School. Um, it's like all that jobs to be done. There's the same guy who wrote, who I don't like know any of these people. I just I just think it's helpful. I just say, this is who you should Google. Um, but he's the same guy who wrote Innovators to Um So there's that much sense to So there's some stuff. So it's an interesting book. It's called Technically Paul. Things about like talking about how some apps are like sexist and racist. Like it kind of she deconstructed why user personas are so dangerous in that because like it's making a lot of assumptions, and then you think that you don't understand who this user is or the user is kind of based on their own bias. So it's an interesting book. What was it called? Uh, technically Paul. Technically wrong. Is a book recommendation. Check it out. I think one more question. You can take this one. You guys, I will tell you where I took dance lessons. <laughs> Specific event to be used as a great point of thing. It's cheap or not. 
Um, yeah, we've actually had a similar uh, issue with this on the guest list. It's like, at what point do you know that people like it's been useful to them? And so I think that that really is the key is to ask ourselves repeatedly what's our goal, um, and then how like what behavior do we want people to do, um, such that we know that they achieve that goal. Right. So for us, like it's really useful if you add all of the people that you're going to invite on your guest list, and then you like press some button that says, I think that's it. Right. And so I think it's a question of repeatedly asking yourself what's the goal and then mapping out all of the steps that you have to do to reach that goal and going um, like as deep as you possibly can into that funnel. Sometimes you don't have um, the like the behavior in the app, but you have to go as deep as you can, as close as you can to the end behavior. Um, to, to, and, then like, and then that's your goal, right? And oftentimes that's really hard and that number is really low. Which is why people always like you know, vague metrics like downloads and stuff because it's it's easier to like some.